our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's international programs, and the University of Iowa's honors programs. They contribute vital time, talent, and logistics to our organization. I also want to thank, uh, as always, the Stanley UI Foundation support organization for their financial support, and today's special financial sponsors, John Menninger and U.S. Bank. Our programs are made possible with these uh, institutions and personal uh, contributions um, by our sponsors. Dr. Powers is an assistant professor of the University of Iowa Department of Anthropology and research associate with the human economy of, at the University of Pretoria. His research focuses on the politics of HIV AIDS epidemic in post-apartheid South Africa. The aim of this work is to better understand the relationship between pathogens and social change in the contemporary phase of global introduction or integration. Now please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Ted Powers. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to start just by thanking some of the folks who invited me to come speak here. Uh, Professor Bill Riesinger, thank you. Uh, Ed Zastro and Sue, of course, thank you for the introduction. Um, so in terms of how I'll be moving forward today, one of the things that I want to do is to situate the South African epidemic, both within the global HIV AIDS epidemic and within South Africa's history, so that you as a group can better understand how some of the key milestones and challenges of head have deep historical roots and also differentiate themselves from perhaps HIV epidemics in other parts of the world. So to begin with, one of the things that we need to appreciate is that the HIV AIDS epidemic comes out of Africa. So recent research in phylogenetic analysis has pointed that the HIV AIDS epidemic moved from Central Africa, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, to Haiti, and later to the United States. And it then spread from these sources to other parts of the world. Now, one of the things that I want to focus on first are the ways in which the epidemic originates in the context of Central Africa. And this is a kind of a bit of phylogenetic analysis that was published in Nature um, that kind of sources the origins of the epidemic uh, based upon analyses of early HIV samples. And what they project is that what their hypothesis is, is that the HIV AIDS epidemic seems to originate in the city of Kinshasa, in the 1920s. And what's really important to keep in mind here is that the HIV AIDS epidemic in the African context is a heterosexual epidemic, i.e. transfers between men and women. All right, and when we think about this period of time, I wanna give a little bit of history about the Congo during this period of time. Of course, the 1920s comes in the aftermath of the Congo Free State, which was a period of time between 1885 and 1908 when 10 million Congolese people died. Um, this period of time, uh, during which about 20% of the population passed away, uh, was one of forced labor, internal migration, and high levels of colonial violence. So when we think about some of the factors which precipitate large-scale epidemics, when we look at this period of time leading up to the 1920s in the Congo, all right, we can see that kind of the dynamics of movement, of compromised immune systems that come with movement of this kind, with displacement, with violence, um, that when we look at these dynamics in the contemporary period, we often see that various practices are associated with it. One is survival sex, or the exchange of sexual access in order to access resources to survive. This often comes with conflict and displacement. Another is rape associated with conflict and war. So when we think about this period of time in the colonial period, all right, this is the origins of movement, of interchange, that we see it around the period of time when HIV becomes generalized. And keep in mind that Kinshasa is a port. Also keep in mind that as you look and see, the epidemic traveled down to Lumbumbashi by the 1960s, that the southeastern corner of the Democratic Republic of Congo, all right, is where the copper mines exist, all right? Now, where you have copper mines and where you have mines in general, you will have miners. Now, it just might happen that all those miners not be from that particular area. They may actually come from outlying areas. And of course, these lines on a piece of paper in front of you don't necessarily accord and limit human movement during this period of time. So when mining is established, 
both in Lumbumbashi and in the Copper Belt in kind of countries that are, are contiguous to this area, Zambia specifically, right? What we see is that HIV then moves via miners, all right, out of this area into other parts of Central Africa. And one might ask, well, why are miners coming from other parts of the African continent? Well, they're paying hut taxes, right? Mechanisms for cost recovery for colonial administration. So when we think about the infrastructure that's developed during the colonial period, it's important to keep in mind this was often paid for by the cash wages that were earned by miners going to places like the Copper Belt. Now, this is a kind of a time series graph that looks at the expansion of the Afri African epidemic from the late 1980s to the early 2000s. And I, I want to point out a couple of things here. And the first is that you can see the spread of HIV across Central Africa by the late 1980s. You can see it moving into West Africa by the early 1990s. And by the late 1990s, early 2000s, you see the epidemic being coming centered on Southern Africa. All right, so I want to talk about some of the broad historical dynamics that drove the extension of the epidemic across the continent. And keep in mind that the DRC is the size geographically of Western Europe. All right, so when we think about this period of time, all right, what's important to keep in mind that from the 60s to the 80s, we see intermittent conflict and civil war across Central Africa. All right, there's a war in Uganda with Tanzania. There's a civil war in Uganda. All right, this is one of the areas where we see an early HIV AIDS epidemic. We also have Africa's first world war in the late 1990s in Central Africa. All right, so when we see what's expanding and driving the expansion of the epidemic, it's similar dynamics of conflict, displacement, and mechanisms for survival that are ongoing across Central Africa during these two decades. Um, of course, there were intermittent pogroms and conflicts in Rwanda starting in the 1960s. Uh, so we need to kind of incorporate that into an understanding of the movement of people and pathogens. Um, now, in terms of the expansion southward, it's important to keep in mind historically that the Cold War was a proxy war on the African continent. So if we're talking about the DRC in Mobutu, are South Africa and the US aligned against countries like Angola, Mozambique, and other of the kind of the third world movement? Right, that there is conflict and displacement also within Southern Africa. Of course, the ANC's armed branch in exile in Konto Wisiswe is also being attacked, right, in various cities and in areas across Southern Africa. So when we think about this period of time, all right, the dynamics that I've described from the early 20th century in the DRC, those can be extended across the southern and central part of the continent over the course of the 20th century. I also want to point out another very important factor, which is starting in the early 1980s to the late 1980s we see a series of structural adjustment programs implemented across the African continent. Now, structural adjustment programs, all right, were implemented by the IMF and World Bank, and what they did was they restructured domestic finances in order to pay external debts. Now, what this really did in practice was impose austerity and cuts in health, social services, food and farming subsidies as well. So it accompanied structural adjustment, all right, were cuts to the health programs in the kind of incipient primary care programs that were developed in the post-colonial period, as well as mechanisms like vector control. So when we talk about the kind of particular mechanisms that enable the spread of pathogens, um, in, in Madagascar between 1986 and 1988, we see in the highlands a malaria outbreak that occurs because vector control is cut in order to kind of produce cost recovery to pay external debts. So that leads to the death of 60,000 people, but it was entirely predictable. We think about the AIDS epidemic and conflict, the primary care mechanisms that would have served as the first line of testing and defense for public health were also cut back during this period of time. Now, why were these countries unable to pay their debts? Well, commodity prices, like today, went into a downward cycle in the 1970s. There were the oil price shocks as well, due to conflicts in the Middle East. Uh, also, there were the Volcker policy shocks, where interest rates on variable loan debt, kind of the US interest rate was raised up to almost 20%. Variable rate loans also skyrocketed. These were not denominated in local currency. Therefore, these debts became unsustainable. Hence, structural adjustment and external intervention. So when we think about the pathogens that are enabled during this period of time, think about the big three, malaria, HIV AIDS, and tuberculosis. During this period of time, we see the mechanisms that were put in place to control the expansion of these really started in the 1960s with independence, not prior to that, actually kind of disassembled and actually these pathogens began to kind of flourish across the continent. So let's look at this picture within situate the African epidemic within the global epidemic. So this is 1990s and you can see the epidemic being kind of focused in the Central African region. 
Um, this is nine, two, or 2000. Um, and actually, South Africa declined to participate in reporting their statistics during this period due to an internal debate. I can tell you that the country would have been dark red at this point with an HIV prevalence among the adult population of over 23%. And here you can see in 2010 um, that South Africa has firmly emerged as the epicenter of the global epidemic um, and Southern Africa, gen Southern Africa generally. So how do we make sense of this picture? Why Southern Africa? Why does HIV take hold in such a strong way in this society? All right, and what I want to talk about now is the particular historical dynamics within South African society that precipitated this epidemic. So one of the things that we need to think about is that South Africa is one of the most unequal societies in the world today. The kind of mechanisms that you use at the level of the UN is the Gini coefficient. Um, and one of the ways in which we see inequality expressed in the South African context is lack of access to health care, a lack of development of health infrastructure in particular parts of the country for particular populations within the country, um, politically produced socioeconomic inequality, um, and this grows out of the, the history of segregation and apartheid. So let's talk a little bit really quickly here about the colonial period in South Africa. As, as many of you may or may not know, it was the Dutch that first settled what's now known as Cape Town and, and kind of then known as the Cape Colony. Um, and this was kind of focused on a mechanism of production that was based upon slave labor and agricultural production to fuel actually the, uh, the mercantile period of trade where they kind of rounded the Cape of Good Hope on their way actually over to Southeast Asia to kind of carry out trade. Now, when South Africa transitioned to kind of the British colonial period in the early 19th century, we see a shift in the way in which the colonies administered, and later in the 19th century, a shift in the political and economic dynamics of the colony itself. And the shift moves from a focus on agricultural production to the one of minerals extraction. All right, this is driven by the discovery of diamonds in Kimberley in 1871 and of gold on the Witzwatersrand area in 1886. So when we think about this period of time, it's a transition to slave-based production, to one of min minerals extraction, in a broader kind of economic adaptation that leads to particular changes in the way in which populations move within the country and the way in which they're segregated and divided. Now, particularly what we're talking about is the creation of a labor migration system of circular migration between urban areas, the urban areas that grew up around the mines, particularly in the present day Johannesburg, in rural areas that were then known as labor reserves and now come to be known as, they were then known as Bantustans, are now known as customary areas. And we have, a, of course, an ex existing form of native reserves in this country today. So one can use that as a rough model for what we're speaking about here. So the native reserves are created in 1912 as a mechanism for consolidating kind of white colonial control of urban areas. So land is expropriated from black populations in rural areas. Uh, folks are pushed onto reserves. Um, and this is to kind of create demand uh, for labor or demand for cash income to supplement domestic production and subsistence agricultural production and to kind of facilitate circular migration of the mines by men. So three six-month contracts, men leave home, earn wages, come home. Now, in urban areas, what we also see uh, is the development of forms of segregation. Now, interestingly, it's often public health uh, that's utilized as a mechanism for putting these measures into place. So a kind of outbreak of bubonic plague in Cape Town on the turn of the 19th century leads to the implementation of urban segregation for the first time in South Africa. Um, and it actually originated in Hong Kong, made its way up to Ghana, and it stopped there. Um, but when we think about this period of time, it's one of interconnection, right? And we need to understand that South Africa is part of a broader colonial adaptation, politically and economically, and it's operating within that context. Now, part of that context in the movement of people all over the world is, of course, of missionaries. And what we see in the kind of urban areas with segregation, it manifests differently in rural areas where we see missions set up, like you see here, Lovedale Mission, um, which serve both as a mechanism for the education of African populations, as well as the primary mechanism for accessing public health. Um, so when we look at the missions and how they're founded, you know, Lovedale Hospital and, and Mission actually served as a mechanism for educating some of the early leaders of the African National Congress. So, Steve Biko, Z.K. Matthews, Govan Mbeki, and these areas often served, and you know, the missionaries often also served as intermediaries between the colonial state 
and indigenous populations. So these are incredibly important institutions in rural areas that set into motions like dynamics of education and ideas of equality that we see influencing later political dynamics. Now, when we think about what's put into motion during the colonial period, it's segregation, inequality, and these are the dynamics that are put into place that apartheid intensifies and expands upon. So I wanna be clear with you all that those dynamics were already underway before apartheid or the, uh, the kind of logic of separateness is implemented as a political philosophy in South Africa. Uh-oh, what did I do? So, the apartheid period in South Africa begins in 1948, all right? It's an intensification of the system of urban segregation, forced removals, and the kind of separate development of the Bantustans. And when we think about this period of time, there's several kind of key developments. The extension of past laws to women, forced removals in urban areas, and the dislocation this creates in black urban social formations. So it's also a period of pioneering developments in primary care. Uh, Sidney Koch, who's a kind of a, the developer of community-oriented primary care, actually develops these ideas in the 1930s in the rural parts of what's today known as KwaZulu-Natal province, then known as Zululand. And the idea of create, doing social epidemiology, of developing clinics that are also working with doctors or with community members, was pioneered and developed and piloted during this period of time, very successful in these areas. And by 48, the apartheid state shut these things down, right? So these, these moments where possibilities emerged of a different political trajectory with rural health and with African social formations, that, to a certain degree, are, are closed down. During this period of time, we also see the closure of rural missions by the apartheid state. Um, you can't have them educating the political opposition, can you? So along with closing this kind of mechanism for education, access to health is also closed with these missions, right? So what we see is a closure of access to health in rural areas, right? And the development of what we call white elephant projects in the capitals of the Bantustans and in kind of the urban townships. So an example of this is Chris Harney Bargwana Hospital in Soweto, which is by all accounts the third largest hospital in the world. So that sounds very impressive. Until you understand that the hospital, since its kind of first days, has been understaffed, staff have been undertrained, the institution has been underfunded, and it's barely operated in a functional fashion since that period of time. And that's sort of the dynamics of, of meeting kind of the burden of disease in South Africa are exacerbated by the fact that building this infrastructure in urban areas meant that you had that same dynamic of circular migration to the mines now develop with access to health resources. So of course these, are, these facilities are gonna become overburdened because they're centralized in urban areas. All right, so what emerges during this time in terms of the dynamics of health? Syphilis from the mines to the rural areas becomes a generalized epidemic. Tuberculosis as well, we also see kind of from the mines to rural areas. And amongst the miners themselves, we see an epidemic of silicosis. All right, so when we think about how HIV spreads, Right, one of the key questions is, you know, how strong is your immune system? Right, now what I want to emphasize here is that the period leading up to late apartheid, when HIV kind of is, is introduced to South African society, the immune systems of minors and people in rural areas are deeply compromised. All right, so when we think about the late apartheid period, we're talking about the anti-apartheid movement and what begins to be a focus on public health. So the 1976 Soweto uprising uh, is a kind of a key moment of change in South African history where the youth take to the streets after the, ling the li kind of the language of education has changed without notice from Afrikaans or from English to Afrikaans. So they showed up for their you know, senior year of high school and the textbooks in a different language. And of course, the black consciousness movement in, in the work of, of Steve Biko and others played an important role in facilitating the rise of, of the youth movement. Um, and so there's a resurgence in the anti-apartheid movement following 76. And of course, you know, if those who have not seen pictures of the 76 youth uprising, you take to the streets and they're, they're shot and killed by, you know, security services of the apartheid state. So um, when we think about this period of time, it's not just a rise of the youth and of the urban townships. There's also a rise of solidarity movements that kind of emerged to be kind of part of the broad-based mass democratic movement in South Africa. These are the mechanisms that served also as the base for the first wave of HIV AIDS activism in South Africa. So when we think about these solidarity-based political activities, it's in human rights-based lawyer mechanisms that are created. So the Legal Resources Center is developed to protect the rights of people who are being tortured by the apartheid state in prison. That served as a mechanism for support for the, the uh, HIV AIDS movement later on. The primary care movement kind of 
following on the, the kind of heels of the Alma-Ata Declaration and of the youth uprising, uh, folks who work in academic hospitals like the University of Iowa Hospital Center kind of drive out on weekends, establish clinics in the townships, all right, and, and treat people who are being tortured and, and injured by the apartheid state. Um, the democratic trade union movement begins in the 1980s, and the urban civic associations began as a mechanism for self-organization um, in urban areas uh, of, of street committees, of area development committees, of township committees, where self-governance emerges as a principle. So when we think about this period of time, all right, of increased intensification of the internal anti-apartheid movement, of the intensification of state violence, this is the situation into which HIV AIDS is introduced in South Africa. The first case is, is identified from a Malawian miner in 1982 on the gold mines in Johannesburg. So this is the context into which HIV AIDS emerges, all right, one of intensified civil conflict within South Africa. Uh, and one of kind of mobilization of various sorts, both of which are incredibly important for understanding why HIV spreads so quickly, as well as why the HIV AIDS movement also forms so quickly. Because the forms of civic association and of kind of social organization against a kind of political force that was, let's say, against the rights of the majority of South Africans can then be applied against the pathogen, in this case, HIV. Now, in terms of what I want you to take out of this brief history that I've tried to move through quickly, my apologies. Uh, I want you to kind of build upon something that the anthropologist Didier Fassin has argued is, is an important way to understand disease. And specifically about the HIV AIDS epidemic in South Africa, Fassin has argued that HIV AIDS is the embodiment of inequality. That those who are most affected by South Africa's history are the most infected. Right? That when we think about how would we correlate the, the question of poverty, of history, of inequality, HIV AIDS is almost like a proxy mechanism for understanding those who've been most discriminated against historically. So understanding the illness then involves contextualizing disease within the particular history and mechanisms by which a society has been transformed over time. So Now that we've got a bit of context, let's talk about some of the key milestones and developments uh, that have occurred with the, the HIV AIDS epidemic in South Africa. Now, the first thing that I'd like to focus on is the first wave <coughs> of HIV AIDS activism. Um, and so what you see here are the pictures of, of two very prominent HIV AIDS activists um, who represent two very different groups uh, within South African society. So on your right um, is Edwin Cameron, who's now the Chief Justice. Uh, of the Constitutional Court in South Africa. Um, Cameron is, is, is part of that group of solidarity-based kind of human rights lawyers who began to work with the anti-apartheid movement. And it just so happens that people like Cameron, Arthur Chaskelson also write the South African Constitution. So that period of time of solidarity-based activism from the legal rights sector, right, begins to kind of also filter into a rights-based approach to HIV AIDS, right? So we see kind of the organization of white middle class men, beginning around the professional class within both the kind of human rights sector, the legal sphere, as well as the primary care sphere, right? Now, when we think about uh, the other aspects of this period of time, um, and this is really from 1982 to about you know, 1990 that we're talking about, um, Simon and Coley is the figure on the left, and he's wearing a shirt for the gay and lesbian organization of the Mitzvahtsrund. And what Coley does is he brings the kind of ANC to the table with HIV AIDS. He begins to organize in the kind of the urban townships across the Transvaal, as it was called at that time. And he begins to argue and carry out debates within the ANC about the importance of HIV AIDS as a human rights issue to be addressed as part of the anti-apartheid campaign and then later as part of the political transition and subsequently to that to be included in the South African constitution, anti-discrimination mechanisms for both kind of same-sex partnerships, right? And later, for rights-based approach to HIV AIDS policy. So this particular period of time, right, we see the contradictions of South African society begin to be addressed by the anti-apartheid movement through the mechanism of HIV AIDS. So when we understand these two organizations, these two kind of aspects of the HIV AIDS movement, we also have to understand that they were strongly supported by the emergence of the democratic trade union movement. So the National Union of Mine Workers, strongly supported the HIV AIDS movement in the first wave and subsequently to this because it was their workers 
who are being infected by HIV. It was affecting their, their members. So that's an incredibly important group to have the support of for a minerals extraction economy, right? Where these are the individuals who are developing value, right? Who are producing value in the economy through the extraction of minerals out of the ground. All right, so I think one of the next key developments in this particular period of time, right, is the, for, is the Rainbow Nation period of time, right? Where the ANC is unbanned, where we move into the political transition, and then actually it moves into the democratic period. And I think for you know, this period of time between 1990 and 1999, what we really want to focus on is the fact that the first wave of the HIV AIDS movement is incredibly influential in the political transition and constitutional negotiations. So they formed the National AIDS Committee of South Africa, or NACOSA. So those kind of variants, those individuals that we pointed at before, become a part of the process of both developing the, the kind of governing rules for a post-apartheid South Africa, as well as creating the foundations for the first national AIDS policy, which was adopted in 1994, which is like, you know, the first year of the democratic period. So it shows that this is a, as a high priority. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, HIV AIDS falls to the wayside during this period of time. You know, restructuring a society is a big job, isn't it? Uh, so creating new government, creating a new province system, restructuring kind of cities and, and, their, and their boundaries. Uh, writing a constitution, all in, you know, restructuring the economy. Now, these, these are the, the issues that take precedence. And as a result, from 1990, HIV prevalence is under 1%. By 1999, it's 23%. So this is that period of time, the Rainbow Nation period, when we see a massive explosion of HIV in South Africa. And, it, you know, I, I think that we, we can look at this period in various ways, but I think one of the issues is, is that there simply might not have been enough capacity, right? There might not have been the health infrastructure, right, because of the way in which South African history had unfolded. There might not have been the human resources capacity in these various ways. These are some of the issues that have been discussed about this period of time, but I think we need to be critical about this, and certainly it's the case that, you know, South Africa's taking an increasingly critical look uh, at the Mandela period uh, in terms of, of the country's history. Now, Following the kind of Rainbow Nation period, the Mandela period, we have the emergence of what I call the ANC's AIDS dissident faction, or a group of powerful individuals from the African National Congress um, find dissident positions on the link between HIV and AIDS that were produced by American scientists, uh, and they adopt these and transform or limit the response to HIV AIDS in South African society based upon this particular belief system. So, it questioned the link between HIV and AIDS, right? And, and, and Becky actually, President Thabo Mbeki, who's pictured here, has recently come out, come out and doubled down and confirmed his position on these beliefs earlier this year. Um, and this particular position uh, linked the emancipation of South African society, uh, the idea of African nationalism, uh, to the idea of creating African solutions to the HIV AIDS epidemic, to rejecting AIDS treatment as toxic and unaffordable, as a mechanism by which the profiteering of the global pharmaceutical industry unfolded, um, and one through which the interests of African societies were not being attended to. So there's many aspects of this where there are kind of elements where a lot of people who are critically minded might agree. But I think really where this issue began to become uh, quite problematic where, is where the link between HIV and AIDS was questioned. Um, now there's the establishment of kind of presidential commissions on this issue, and I, this is Dr. Mantu Shabalala Misamang, on the right, and she's the National Minister of Health. So when we talk about the institutional mechanisms that were in place, the presidency and the National Department of Health, the norms generating institutions within the country for policy, all right, were, had, had individuals that kind of were in charge of these offices and institutions that were questioning linked between HIV and AIDS. And as a result, HIV AIDS treatment was not adopted in South Africa, although it was scientifically proven and the kind of epidemic was actually quite, you know, at a high, it was expanded at a very high rate in the late 1990s. Um, and as a result, uh, a study estimated that 330,000 South Africans uh, died prematurely due to delays in adoption of HIV AIDS treatment. So what happens as a result? Well, there's a second wave of HIV AIDS activism that emerges. And you know, key activists like Mark Haywood and Zaki Akhmat were actually trained by members of the first wave of HIV AIDS activists. So when we talk about Edwin Cameron, you know, future Chief Justice of, of a Demo Democratic South Africa, he worked with Zaki Akhmat and Mark Haywood in the AIDS Law Project, which was, he established uh, through a, an institution that he created. 
So when we talk about the connection between these two waves, it's actually quite direct, that there's actor networks that expand over time and serve as a mechanism for uniting this the late apartheid period to the second wave of HIV AIDS activism. And quite central to the second wave is the formation of the Treatment Action Campaign in 1998. It was actually formed uh, at the death, at the funeral uh, of Simon and Coley. So when we think about this period of time, the lack of, of access to treatment for first wave activists, which leads to their death, is the precipitating factor for the second wave of HIV AIDS activism. And they serve as the primary social organization that leads the charge against the ANC's aid dissident faction in kind of trying to create access to treatment. I mean, after all, they're called the Treatment Access Campaign, or TAC, right? So when we think about how this campaign unfolds for access to treatment, what's incredibly important is that they're supported by the Legal Resources Center, right, which emerged after 76, in leading Supreme Court, you know, what's for us would be a Supreme Court case, but for them will be a constitutional court case for access to treatment within South Africa. And this would be for the prevention of mother-to-child transmission. This is carried out in 2002, and they win that court case. Unfortunately, due to the fact that, you know, public health institutions, the presidency were staffed or controlled by the AIDS dissident faction, we see very slow movement on that. All right, so what occurs is a civil disobedience campaign, uh, a campaign of direct action. Uh, and they take to the streets, they occupy police you know, stations, they call for the arrest of the president and the minister of health for culpable homicide, right? They're put in jail. And eventually, they negotiate behind closed doors with then Deputy President Jacob Zuma, who's working with the trade union movement, who are backing the HIV AIDS activists, and they lead to the development of the comprehensive treatment plan in 2003. Now, this is the mechanism during, you know, by which treatment access should have become available in a widespread way in South Africa. But it doesn't because of the control of state health institutions by the AIDS dissident faction, right? So although the law and the policy on paper look to be you know, quite progressive, although they utilize the right to health to argue for widespread access to PMTCT and for AIDS treatment, those are necessary but insufficient conditions for people to experience the full benefit of the right to health in South Africa. All right. So when we think about this period of time, right, coalitions were built, legal challenges were carried out, direct action, civil di disobedience were employed as tactics and strategies, um, and these were the mechanisms by which policy was changed, right? But that was not net, that was not sufficient. That was not s adequate to enable the majority of people living with HIV/AIDS to sustain their lives, and people continue to die as a result. Now, what changes? What happens? Well, after the International AIDS Conference 2006 in Toronto, when AIDS dissidents display garlic, lemon, and beetroot alongside ARVs as forms of AIDS treatment, um, which leads to international uproar, right? Uh, what occurs is that there's actually a breaking point reached within the ANC. And as a result, uh, members of the ruling party begin to kind of pull the AIDS movement into the state. And they restructure the South African National AIDS Council, or SENEC, to be a broad-based, hybrid kind of government civil society institution. Uh, and the deputy chair of the institution is Mark Haywood, who is a co-founder of the Treatment Action Campaign, a member of the AIDS Law Project, and one of those activists that was trained uh, by first wave activists. So what this does, right, and the kind of the AIDS movement moves into the state. They occupy the state, and they kind of control the development of policy norms that then can oversee, and they are allowed to oversee and, and kind of monitor implementation with the National Department of Health. Now, this sounds like a wonderful plan, and as you can see, it actually, in the end, does lead to kind of large-scale, like, you know, increases in spending on HIV AIDS treatment, but it's not really until 2007, 2008 that this begins, because that is the period of time when the AIDS dissident faction is pushed out of office. All right, so when we look at this period of time, and Becky, Thabo Mbeki is recalled from office as, as being president uh, because he's actually running indirectly for a third term of office. He runs for, to be president of the ANC, where he will actually control party policy, and so he won't be president, but he'll control the party that is, is operating within the state. Um, now, the ANC turns against this, um, and as a result, Jacob Zuma is put forward as a presidential candidate, and Becky's recalled from office early, uh, Mantu Shabalala Misamang is recalled from her post as National Minister of Health, and we see very fast movement on HIV AIDS. 
Uh, so between 2008 and 2012, we see a massive increase in the allocation of resources to the HIV AIDS epidemic, to m rolling out access to HIV AIDS treatment. And you can see in this graph, um, this is the number of people on antiretroviral therapy. All right? So when we look at this period of time, there were increases right, leading up to that period of time that we see kind of ramping up. But post-2008, right, in those four years, universal treatment has reached. 80% of people in need of AIDS treatment, particularly amongst women and children, have that by 2012. So this is driven by Senec and Senec is being pushed by the HIV AIDS movement, right? So when we talk about how universal treatment was achieved, all right, it's important to keep in mind this kind of long duration between the late 1990s and 2012 that it took to push government policy, and eventually not just to push government policy, not just to build alliances of people in the state, but to actually move into the state, move into Senec, move into a government institution, and actually direct policy by the, the, those folks within those institutions directly, all right? So, this is like the really big success story here, right? The universal treatment's been achieved. This is the largest HIV AIDS treatment program in the world. It's also the largest you know, HIV AIDS epidemic in the world, all right? But that's a, a massive achievement. So now that universal treatment, treatment has been achieved, what are the challenges that lay ahead? Now, a big issue here is that HIV incidence is steady in, in English. What that means is that the infection rate is steady. It's level, it's the same. So as more folks go on treatment, that means that there are more people living with HIV AIDS in South Africa. So we're up to almost seven million now, right, of people living with HIV AIDS in the country. So one of the issues is, of course, uh, that we're gonna see rising treatment costs, right? As more people live longer lives, you know, HIV AIDS is a chronic medical condition on when you, when you, if you have access to treatment and you stay on your treatment, so if someone is infected, you know, between the ages of 15 and 24, you know, they may live to the, be their mid-60s, right? So they're gonna be on treatment for the rest of their lives. And they actually, you know, need to stay on treatment because if they go off treatment, the virus mutates in their body, then you move to second line treatment, which is more expensive, right? And of course, a lot of these debates are about access to medicines. And, you know, there's a lot of pressure in, in, from civil society groups and from communities for access to HIV as treatment. It's clear that people can sustain life on treatment, right? The arguments about the, the link between HIV and AIDS, you know, while still being resuscitated by some kind of sectors of South African society, right? Largely speaking, uptake has been, you know, quite strong of treatment. So what we're seeing now is not a question of questioning the link between HIV and AIDS, but questioning how long South Africa can, can afford to pay for treatment, you know? They, you know, about 30% of AIDS treatment is, is, is donor funded, but that still leaves the largest HIV AIDS epidemic in the world, you know, being kind of addressed by a middle income country. So when we think about where treatment is heading, right, one of the big developments of the last five years is pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now again in English, uh, what that means is that people can take antiretroviral therapy prior to exposure to the HIV and this serves as a mechanism for preventing infection. So right now, in urban areas across the United States, populations at risk are on pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP. Now, in the United States, the epidemic is, is relatively concentrated amongst men who have sex with MSMs. There are some kind of larger trends towards, uh, in urban areas towards other populations. All right, but in South Africa, Given the size of the epidemic, one of the questions with PrEP is how many people have to be on pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV transmission. If we're talking about an epidemic of over 6 million people and a population of nearly 60 million, is it everyone and their partners? Do they have one partner? So how do you begin to kind of cost this out? How do you begin to kind of say, we're going to want an AIDS, you know, AIDS free world by 2030. This is Sidi Bay and other folks at UNAIDS. And I, I think that one of the questions we need to ask here is, what kind of solidarity is going to be necessary to massively upscale pre-exposure prophylaxis in South Africa so that the 15 to 24 group that they're targeting in South Africa right now, right, can actually grow up without, without being exposed to HIV. And the, the current strategy right now emerging out of SANIC is to target uh, sex workers. And so the sex worker strategic plan just came out about a month and a half ago. Um, now this is incredibly important because it builds on the most recent research where half of sex workers in Johannesburg were found to be HIV positive. Now that sounds very high, doesn't it? Well, earlier research on the M3 highway which connects Johannesburg and Durban 
found that four to five sex workers had HIV. So when we think about how the kind of way in which PrEP is being targeted, they're going to really focus on, you know, sectors of the population first, where they know that there's a high concentration of HIV. To, you know, PrEP also suppresses viral load, which means someone is, doesn't, the possibility of transmitting HIV is, is a lot lower. All right. Now, one of the things that serves as an important backdrop to the discussion of treatment of pre-exposure prophylaxis is the fact that staff Africa's macroeconomic policy has generally kept allocations for health relatively steady. Now, an important bit of contextual information that builds on the broader historical overview that I gave is that South Africa really has a dual epidemic of HIV AIDS and tuberculosis, a syndemic, where one builds off the other. You're exposed to TB, your immune system is compromised, you're more likely to get HIV. You're exposed to HIV, your immune system is compromised, you're more likely to get TB. And unfortunately, it's not just straight old tuberculosis. This is multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, extensively drug resistant tuberculosis, and now total drug resistant tuberculosis. So when we think about the burden of disease in South Africa, and we think about the level of resources which should be allocated within a particular society, right? these kind of broad normative claims towards, say, the Abuja Declaration and allocating 15% of your budget to health really must run up against the historical constraints of inequality in South Africa as well. You know, how does one undo 300 years of unequal development? 350 years, let's be honest, right? How, how does one begin to address right, the broad social inequalities that also manifest in the area of disease and illness, but addressing those disease and illnesses has a cost associated with them. Many of these medicines are patent controlled. And as a result, I mean, you know, there's a high cost involved with upscaling these sorts of access to treatment. So universal treatment has been achieved, right? However, incidence is steady. The current interventions to control the spread of HIV AIDS may, you know, be let's say, given the scale of doing so, unaffordable right now in South Africa. So one of the questions that really have to be faced is, you know, how will the epidemic be ended in South Africa? Right now, the technology exists. Pre-exposure prophylaxis works. What are we going to decide? Is South Africa going to go it alone? Who's going to work with them? How will we upscale? These are the questions that we're facing now. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. What did moral authority, that's in quotes, uh, types such as Archbishop Tutu and Nelson Mandela contribute to the national dialogue about how to respond to HIV AIDS? I think both Tutu and Mandela played a very positive role. Um, Mandela actually uh, publicly broke with Mbeki during the Mbeki presidency, and this is you know, not expected. Uh, for a previous ANC president to actually publicly critique a standing ANC president, you know, of the country, um, he actively went to public protests. He wore the HIV positive T-shirt. He disclosed that one of his sons had died from HIV. So when we think about Mandela's role uh, in the late 1990s, you know, clearly uh, there could have been more done. Let's say to be succinct. Um, amidst a kind of a sea of, of, of pressing priorities, and current, including in current, recurrent currency crises. Um, but there was a lot of kind of very strong action taken by Mandela after the period of his presidency to address stigma, um, to kind of publicly support access to HIV AIDS treatment. Um, and I think that, you know, Archbishop Desmond Tutu has been very clearly on message on this the entire time um, with the AIDS activists. So I think that one of the issues is is that these kind of uh, aspirational, symbolic leaders of the anti-apartheid movement, right, uh, were, were, were important during a particular period of time, but that kind of state control of public health institutions was an impi a structural impediment that could not be overcome um, until there was the removal of particular individual, individuals from office. So when we think about this period of time, I think it's important to kind of think about the kind of not only the role of an individual within society, but also the way in which they occupy certain roles in institutions, um, be they within the AIDS movement or outside of it. But they played an important role, and I think it was a universally positive one. <laughs>
We have a few questions. Um, I'll try to combine them a little bit. And this has to do with, I think your, your quote was 30% uh, comes from the South African nation itself for health care, maybe 70% outside. Vice versa. In any event, the outside is the money coming from the U.S., such as in George Bush's programs, um, Bill Gates, uh, private contributions, um, a little of both, if you could comment on that. So, right, the, uh, the world of foreign donor funding for HIV AIDS programs is a complex one, as you might imagine. And, uh, you know, the way in which it's been defined as uh, by people on the ground who go around townships and go to different kind of clinical sites has been a mix of either anarchy or projectification, i.e. that access to health has been become a process of analyzing or, let's say, accessing different projects. And in South Africa, th that's also been true. And so um, you know, the Presidential Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, uh, PEPFAR, you know, has been important in terms of, of providing access to treatment and resources in South Africa. Uh, importantly, that donor program bypasses the South African state. So it goes directly to non-governmental organizations and community-based organizations. So that one's structured in, the in that fashion. The Global Fund uh, you know, for HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria has also been a very important donor to South Africa. Those funds go through the Ministry of Health uh, and are, are kind of deployed within that particular framework. Um, so there are also important multilateral donor, don donor you know, programs. You know, after Mbeki was pulled out of office, uh, the UK actually came forward uh, you know, with, a, with actually a, a strong donor support for both uh, the National AIDS Council and for uh, expansion of PMTCT. So it's really issue-based, um, and there are a lot of countries that, that are expressing solidarity through support uh, for kind of AIDS treatment programs. You know, but I, but I, what I would say is is really uh, important to think about alongside that is that <laughs> governments uh, and donor organizations you know can't do this alone. Um, really an important group to bring to the table are the producers and patent holders for retroviral, retroviral therapy. Um, they hold the key to this particular issue because they control pricing. Um, so there might be a certain amount of resources that are allocated to fight AIDS in South Africa. The question is, how many people can go on treatment within that given amount? And I think that's really where the conversation needs to be shifted uh, for us to begin to think about actually ending AIDS. Can you speak um, a little bit about HIV-AIDS among children in South Africa? So the impact on children has shifted over time. Uh, one of the first targets of the second wave of HIV-AIDS activism was, as I mentioned, the prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV-AIDS. And we've known since the early 1990s that uh, AZT, uh, cuts the kind of rate of vertical transmission, right, across generations, they call it vertical transmission, by about half. Um, combination, kind of PMPCT, uh, with nevirapine, cuts it by above 90%. So when we get to the period of time when, when dual therapy is being implemented in, in South Africa in the kind of mid-2000s, right, you know, one of the goals is to keep it above 90%, right, to keep the you know, transmission rate, i.e. below 10% between mother and child when the mothers have HIV. So the number of children who are born with HIV AIDS is decreasing, right? And this is one of the target areas that you know you can kind of prevent that actually with a very inexpensive and efficient mechanism. Uh, however, we've had, you know, some of the productive generations taken out of South African society, haven't we? So we actually have a big issue of AIDS orphans um, or children who were also born uh, without being registered for the necessary paperwork to receive state grants. Um, you know, it's child grant and whatnot for forms of state support. So a big question is, is how can those children be supported? And of course, there's many donor organizations that are doing kind of, you know, AIDS orphan programs. Um, but, you know, simply, you know, housing and clothing and feeding an orphan, you know, doesn't necessarily deal with all the contradictions that, that they're going to face as a young person growing up in South African society. Um, social reproduction is a complex process whereby knowledge uh, and kind of cultural practices are passed across generations. Um, so when we think about this, this con the, the way in which HIV AIDS figures into the lives of, of, of children, all right, it's one where those children are, if they're not infected, they're affected, right? Whether it's family members, whether it's your parents, whether you're living with your grandmother. Th these are questions that I, I think permeate South African society. Um, and it's, it's, it's really difficult to know what the long-term effects of that will be. Um, 
but I think that we're, we're going we're gonna to have to wait and see. Could you further explain the rationale for the ANC's AIDS dissident faction's uh, point of view? And what kind of power, I think you'd mentioned that they still have some, um, still have that, um, and why does it still hold sway in, with some folks? Right, so there was a controversial clinical trial with AZT in the early 1990s. It caused a vigorous debate within the AIDS circles in the United States itself. Now, Peter Duisberg, other sci American scientists, were heavily critical over whether the way in which the clinical trial was carried out sh simply showed high levels of toxicity or whether it actually showed remission of the virus. As a result, those debates about AIDS treatment and the kind of concomitant link between HIV and AIDS that kind of grew out of that debate uh, were picked up on by other groups in society, societies around the world, including South Africa. So, you know, one of the things about dissidents and dissidents of science is that the internet has been a wonderful mechanism for the expression and extension of those belief systems. Uh, and it's, it appears as though that is the mechanism by which the AIDS dissident faction was first exposed to these ideas in South Africa. They were then disseminated uh, by the president of South Africa to other kind of key allies within the state. And for a long time, we weren't sure about this, but and Becky recently came out and confirmed this, an autobiography by Frank Chicane, uh, also confirmed that Mbeki was the key source of the information. And the way in which this continues to manifest is that, you know, Mantu uh, Shabal Misimang and Tabo Mbeki are no longer formally in politics. That does not mean that their acolytes have gone away. So when we think about some of the folks that were aligned within the dissident faction, they still hold positions within the state. Um, and so the, the question about whether, you know, what's the, the kind of, half-life of, of this sort of a belief system, what are the long-term effects? You know, one of the questions is, you know, with the uptake population, you know, if one actually is ill and you eat healthy foods, your health recovers to a degree, doesn't it? So garlic, lemon, beetroot, sweet potatoes, these things actually will, if you're, you know, slightly ill, help to kind of, in a homeopathic fashion, heal your body. They will not cure AIDS. But one has to really ask whether or not people's everyday experiences of those foods having a healing quality led to them to at least consider this hypothesis as having a degree of validity, right? And we can't discount the long-term potential impacts of this, right? It looks like the uptick numbers override this, right? There, I mean, there's a lot of research on this. There's a lot of people looking into this. Um, we also have to ask whether or not people are somewhat circumspect of right researchers showing up with a survey and saying, what do you think about this? Remember, the belief system was about profiteering of global pharmaceutical corporations and the ways in which various actors support and extend the agenda of those corporations. Now, would a researcher doing research about AIDS fit into that particular demographic for individuals in certain parts of the country? Perhaps. So one of the questions we have to ask is about what kind of information do we really have? When does someone really expose their belief system to you? after they've known you for five or 10 years, five minutes, right? So these are, these are some of the questions that we have to really grapple with in this instance. And I think that in terms of the way that I've been looking at it, in the end, we have to look at treatment uptake. Are people going on treatment or not? Have they seen their friends live or not? And I think in the end, what we see is people are going on treatment when they're sick. Um, so it's a very kind of complex set of issues, but there's been a lot of books written on as a belief system. Personally, I looked at it as, a belief system in terms of how it was put into practice politically through institutions, through the limitations on treatment, so that I could actually see how it worked in motion rather than an abstract set of ideals. And last question, we'll try to be on. Uh, are you optimistic um, uh, about the, uh, the future at all? I mean, and I, but I think with the, 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 I mean, do you see with the prep and, and other things going on politically that, that the, the corner has been turned, so to speak? I think that the developments earlier this year about a, a sex worker strategic plan for me were an incredibly important tr transition point um, because it focuses on the de decriminalization of sex work. And this is an incredibly important vector for disease control in South Africa, and particularly 
when you have a generalized epidemic that's sexually transmitted, um, criminalizing the population that might be, might be the kind of key point for, for addressing transmission would seem to be maybe a counterproductive strategy. Um, you know, I've, I've spoken with people in the National AIDS Council. I know that there are very smart, hardworking people that are based in this institution. Um, I think that we're entering a different period of time in the history of HIV AIDS because we now have tools. And we have tools and we have the knowledge to understand that we can halt transmission. We should still keep people alive, but we can halt transmission. The question is about collective political will. South Africa does not have the resources to go this on their own. They do not, to upscale treatment of pre-exposure prophylaxis. The question is, who will come together in solidarity with South African society to produce that outcome? And I'm hopeful about the capacity of South African people to address this issue and to develop tools and interventions within their own society. When it comes to the mobilization of global resources around pre-exposure prophylaxis, I've not seen a lot of movement yet. So perhaps that will come, but I've not heard it brought up in the election cycle. I'm not necessarily expecting to hear about this, but it's certainly an issue that we as a society should be considering discussing about. And that's why I'm very thankful for the opportunity to speak with you and bring these issues to your attention. On behalf of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, I do want to thank you, Dr. Powers, for your presentation. I also want to thank our sponsors once again, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the U of I's Honors Programs, Stanley UI Foundation Organization for their generous financial support. Again, we also want to thank today's financial sponsors, John Menninger and U.S. Bank and City Channel 4. And last but not least, our coveted mug. Uh, we want to present uh, to you for uh, taking the time to enlighten us on this topic. Thank you very much.